So I'm just going to kick off by saying that this is episode 41 of the Information Revolution, and it's exciting Holy. that we've got this far. <laughs> whoop, whoop. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll go around. My name is Michael Upton. I'm in information management in... Uh, <laughs> And information management. That's beautiful. <laughs> Great intro. <laughs> I'm an information management consultant, and I'm in Wellington, New Zealand. Hi, and I'm Judy Verno, and I'm an information architect, and I'm also in uh, Wellington, New Zealand. And I'm Carl Miller, as I'm an information management consultant working out of Adelaide in Australia. Brilliant. And Episode 41. Yeah. yeah. And what I proposed we do for this one was uh, I'm going to share three things about Microsoft 365 that I've learned that I kind of wish I knew sooner about how things are structured and how it's different from working with an EDRMS. Or, or presumably earlier versions of SharePoint. Yeah, mm. absolutely yeah. true. Mm. So three things you wish you'd known. Yeah, so I guess um, these will focus on SharePoint, unsurprisingly. Um, which nowadays is actually branded SharePoint in Microsoft 365. But Judy, you're right. It's pretty different to um, how things used to be in the on-premise versions of SharePoint. And uh, the first thing that was on my mind is really just about the existence of these things called Microsoft 365 Groups. Um, and lots of people do know about Microsoft 365 Groups, but I think it's really critical to get your head around this if you're thinking about how to structure information inside um, uh, SharePoint in Microsoft 365. So a Microsoft 365 group is uh, like a security group. Um, and you might know Active Directory. You might talk about, you know, oh, this is an AD group is a thing that people used to always say. Microsoft, in its infinite wisdom, has renamed Azure Active Directory. So it's called Entra ID. And Microsoft 365 groups are a thing that exists in Entra ID. So basically, the thing in uh, a Microsoft 365 group is a list of the members and the owners. And so it's a list of people, basically, you know, the user accounts who can do something in the system. And why it really, really matters is because most of the time when you create a SharePoint site, it's going to create a Microsoft 365 group to manage permissions. And so it's going to say, cool, if you're an owner of the Microsoft 365 group, you get certain SharePoint permissions. And if you're a member of the M365 group or Microsoft 365 group, you get different permissions. You know, you basically can do less. And so, so it's you, usually true. Are you saying that the when that site's set up, it automatically creates the group? Yes. Yeah, I did understand that. Okay. And? it creates a mailbox, which is kind of confusing for a bunch of people. And depending on the point that you start from, that mailbox shows up for people um, in Outlook. So um, in, in your list of folders down the left-hand so side of Outlook, down the bottom, you get groups nowadays. And uh, you might see your Microsoft 365 group there, basically with a shared mailbox. So you cannot have Microsoft 365 group without that mailbox. So you cannot turn that off. And most importantly, I, I don't know why I've not started with this point, is if I create a Microsoft team, so you know I'm sitting in Teams and I go new team, it creates the Microsoft 365 group. It's compulsory every time so that you can manage the membership of the team. It creates the SharePoint site every time so that you have a place to save files. And it creates that mailbox every time so that it can annoy you and cause headaches for management over time. No, but it, it does that for various sort of compliance purposes. It creates copies of things. It creates copies of Teams chats. It creates copies of uh, channel posts and such things uh, in hidden folders inside that mailbox. And as far as I know, that's the main reason why that's a compulsory part of it. So... Almost all the time when we're thinking about places where I want to save documents in, in 365, I'm going to end up with a combo deal, basically. I'm going to get fries with that, whether or not I wanted them. So I'm going to get the Microsoft 365 group. I'm going to get the SharePoint site. If it's Teams connected, then, of course, I get the team itself. And I always get this mailbox as well. 
And hopefully it's pretty self-evident why I'm even saying this, because that's complicated when you're thinking about the architecture, because it makes, you know, you have to start thinking, okay, well, basically so what for any of those things in terms of um, where I'm expecting people to work. Um, the mailbox thing might set off alarm bells like, oh, well, if it creates a mailbox and I didn't even know it's there, for example, if I start in Teams and I create a team, then the mailbox is actually hidden from people. Um, people can start sending emails to that and then you can't, uh, by default, you're not going to see where those emails went when you go to Team, uh, so when you go to Outlook. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's 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 a slightly complicated thing, but I think um, one of the main things about it is it probably um, like like the main thing it's all about. If you think about that group being like a security group sitting inside what you might have thought of as Active Directory, then it's um, it's a really simple way of managing permissions, and it's the first time ever that um, Microsoft has given end users the ability to basically um, change the membership of a group and therefore change who has access to what in the system without needing to actually get into what was Active Directory, now Intro ID. And so it's kind of created this situation where suddenly you can delegate out a whole lot of control in terms of who has access to what. So you can say, cool, if you're the owner of this site or you're the owner of this group you're the owner of this team you can um, add and remove people and automatically confer certain privileges um, without having to faff around and go what what permission level am i trying to get here you know it's just you're in or out you're a member or you're not so um yeah so it's it's quite intriguing i'm gonna pause there <laughs> reactions have you seen this out in the real world so all of a sudden, there's not just what you think you're creating, but there's all this other stuff as well that you've got to manage, or all these other repositories or whatever we want to call them, places that content could be. So am I right in thinking then it makes permissioning simpler, but it makes information management harder? Would that be true? I mean, there's a couple of things that you can do straight away. So for instance, you can throw a setting that will um, hide the mail, sorry, it hides the email address from the Outlook global address list. So what it means is that if I start typing ahead and say we've created a team called Information Revolution, out of the box, Information Revolution at whatever address is going to exist as, you know, as a mailbox address, but we can hide that. So we can hide it from Outlook with this one setting. So you need to work with your techies who know how to script these things and they can just go, junk, you know, hide, hide these things as part of your provisioning process when you're creating a new team or a new site. On the flip side, another thing you could do is you could say, cool, whenever I need a shared mailbox, if I don't think they need um, a SharePoint site connected with that mailbox, because this is the flip side. If you create a Microsoft 365 group because you want shared mailboxes, um, you might end up with this extra site you don't want. Um, you can uh, also script or, or just do it manually. You can take out, take out the permissions on that site so that those people who are owners or members of the group don't actually get to the site. Yeah. But you've got to understand that you need to do these things. Yeah, for sure. That's the, yeah. That's why I'm here. <laughs> that's that's oh, well why I wanted said. to put this out. Well in the world. <laughs> what a saint! <laughs> no, no, but I, I did want to put this out there because I think you know these are these are um, things that you know they they do just require a bit of thought, and it is quite a different way of thinking about how things are structured. And I guess, for example, with this stuff, like I would, I would not recommend anyone tries to fight this in terms of like, oh, I'll try and hide oh, sorry, the mailbox. I'll try and kill the mailbox or something or I'll try and never use 365 groups like they're so um so ingrained in the whole way that you know the structures are architected that you know it would be yeah it'd be very challenging to to architect anything and not use those things and, and if I remember rightly that's because um 
groups were actually a feature of exchange originally, weren't they? And they kind yeah, of yeah. they, they kind so. of propagated into AD rather than the other way uh, rather than the other way around. And so what you're probably dealing with there is a hangover of some kind of feature that was designed 20 years ago that is now everywhere that you can't get rid of. Yeah, and and Microsoft's greatly reducing. Uh, uh, sorry, I'll say um, most of our day jobs and sort of information and records we don't necessarily get deep in how active directory itself works but the kinds of different things that you could create there like a distribution list versus a shared mailbox versus security group all of that stuff they're really simplifying it but they really are reducing it down to microsoft 365 group which has all of these bits that hang off it or a security group and so they're really driving that, for instance, if you want a distribution list, you want to use a Microsoft 365 group now, which um, means that, yeah, that I think that's where the information risk is, that you end up with extra repositories because you're just like, oh, I just thought we wanted a mailbox. I think yeah. that's potentially more risky than the flip side where it's like, oh, I just wanted a SharePoint side. So, Michael, number two. Yeah. Number two. If you've got this kind of structuring element around a group, the other thing is that when you create a SharePoint site, it is not part of any association with another SharePoint site. So we're really, really used to the idea that like, uh, for instance, oh, I'm doing this work in the finance and our finance needs another site. I'll add it to the other finance sites. And technically that doesn't, it, it like that doesn't relate to a technical solution in Microsoft 365. You do not have the finance sites. You just have a site and that's finances and you have another site. And that's also, you know, if you say, oh, these are all owned by finance or they're all to do with finance. But out of the box, a site's a site. It just sits there and it's not like it's got a thing above it, like a sort of parent that's connected to other things. And it's not like it has sort of other subsites anymore. Subsites used to be a feature of, um, I mean, and I, I believe you technically can create subsites still, but no one does. Um, and and so that's that's really different if we're used to thinking in hierarchies and we're used to thinking, oh yeah, I'm building out a file plan or a taxonomy and that basically looks like a folder structure. You definitely have substructure inside a site, you know, you can have document libraries, document sets, folders, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, but above the site level, the site just sits there. Yeah. So if you want any kind of structural reference ability or anything like that, so you can have some kind of referencing between things, you've got to create it yourself. Yeah, yeah, and that's, that's why you need to do your information architecture up front maybe. so that you've got those hubs that you can connect all those things up yeah, to, to allow you to do that. It, it is the perpetual lesson of Microsoft 365. It doesn't matter who I've looked at it with and where I've looked at it. The secrets to managing it well are governance and architecture. Yeah. And if you're not going to do those two things, you should just just stop. You know, just, just, just don't, you know, because it's kind of, these things are sufficient and necessary and, you know, spend $10 less and you might as well not spend any money. You know, it's that, yeah, that problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's so, I mean, one of the key things is from a management perspective, I cannot, um, I, can't, I can't apply retention and disposal to sort of a parent in a tree or the top of a branch in a tree of sites and have it cascade down. And there's very little you can do in terms of permissions as well. So you can do a little bit, but why I wanted to introduce the groups first is because the group is the primary mechanism for managing permissions. So that idea of the Microsoft 365 group and, uh, you know, we're going to let um, the owners of a particular group manage permissions, like that's, that replaces a, a tradition that we're really used to, you know, from shared drives and, and you know, all the way that we'll we'll apply something at the top of this sort of section of a hierarchy and it will cascade down to everything else. But then, um, Judy, you mentioned hubs. So, yeah, there is this concept of a hub. And I guess a, a key thing about the hub is that the hub really exists as uh, um, delivering a mechanism for end users, basically. Like a hub, the, the value of connecting stuff up to a hub is so that 
as a user, I have better context for looking yeah. at stuff, right? So like a front door. Wayfinding yeah. signposting. Yeah. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. All of those, yeah. Yeah. And if you go and look at Microsoft's narrow view of information architecture, it's very much about wayfinding. They love that phrase, yeah. And so it's like, how would I get to the information that I need, you know? So I typically think about that in terms of discovery. So how do I discover new stuff that I didn't know was there versus, you know, maybe we split findability and say findability is getting back to the thing I'm used to. Yeah, I mean, that is a that is a big thing, the, the how do you discover stuff that you didn't know was there? I mean, that's fine. Yeah. Even if there's a hub there, mm. you know, that, that front door that allows you to go in and see see what all the possibilities are within within that particular area it's never going to let you see what those folks over there are doing unless it's been you know been set up in that You're way but, that yeah. yeah so so it's it, it the old cliche of the double yeah, sword like it's yeah sorry what was that I just said, again, architecture, you've got to build yeah. it yourself if yeah. you want people to be able to do that. So, again, we're back to architecture as the necessary prerequisite for doing anything well in 365. But it's got to be planned. Yeah. Because the second yeah, people start right. creating things, they're, they're just unmoored and unconnected and you lose control yep. because you've got no governance. Uh-huh. And there's, yeah. there's plenty of ways to, you know, like sort of follow a site, um, navigate back to a site you are in the other day, you know, you yeah, uh, get back to individual pieces of content that you were working with, you know, the um the OneDrive apps and so forth, they will get you back to things really well. Uh SharePoint app bar, Teams app bar, like there's a bunch of different ways to get back to things. But it is, I think, primarily that idea of discovery of like how do I go and sort of like I'm new here, how do I browse across the stuff and find what I need? Yeah. Or or just it's understand actually- what's there. Yeah. And it's it's interesting because we we have a mutual friend um, who has he, their approach to and yes you know exactly who I'm talking about um, but the, again you know the the approach there to managing team sites has been someone creates a team they get a phone call from a person in the information management team to say hey I've just noticed you created a team what did you create it for. And half of what they do is actually say, hey, you know, we've already got a team for that, right? And it's already got, you know, lists and workflows and all kinds of things set up to support this thing that you want to do. And so it becomes instead of letting people create all of this, you know, unmoored, unconnected stuff that just, you know, represents waste and dross, people just get gradually directed back to things that are purpose built to help them do their work, which, you know, again, I love. It's kind of a it's the most subtle form of governance. It's let us help you. So the, the word governance has come up a few times, I think. Um, and I was it's thinking, almost like we did an episode on it. Too, yeah, too. I, I believe we did. Um, in setting up the security groups, do we think that that's something that an information management team should be doing? Or where do we think that sits comfortably in the organisation? I mean, I know it depends, but but just as some, some yeah. you know, make some value judgments, some thoughts, yeah. I mean, I'm, I am absolutely repeating myself, but the Microsoft three six five group concept means accepting some level of delegation, like saying, "All right, um, for this particular bit, um, the owners of that Microsoft three six five group get to add and remove right. members, and that gives them, you know, that manager's permissions there." So there's not a need to create a separate security group if there's a, a sensible reason to manage things on 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 that kind of basis. So sorry, like on a, on a group basis. But I think Microsoft 365 Group, when it hangs off a team, you know, the primary focus is on thinking about collaboration and who do I need to collaborate with in the here and now, which is a different question to who needs access to information over time. And so that does, I think, in terms of the thinking and the design around permissions and security, I think that must involve information folks. Like, cause you must be thinking about, well, what are those scenarios where people need to access information? It's not the entire organization that needs that access, or, you know, it's not appropriate that the organization has full access for some reason. However, it shouldn't be just sort of who's currently working on it and therefore who's the member of a particular team. Um, yeah, 
there, there are things like, I mean, the other thing I would encourage around the Microsoft 365 groups, and I meant to say this at the start, is um, you can access all the groups that you're a member of now. You can go, you go click on your profile and you browse through to, you know, my groups. You can see the groups that you're in, you can see the groups that you own, and you can self-manage um, your membership there. You can leave groups. Uh, you can, you know, obviously add people if you're an owner. Um, and so it's, it's quite sort of transparent and you can see the name of the group and you can see its description, which, um, you know, it, to me, it's really sort of Microsoft's really trying to put these things in people's faces quite deliberately. Um, so I wonder if the direction over time will be more towards sort of guidance and direction and design and then monitoring. Mm. Yeah. But less less of the feeding and watering in the middle there, like less of the button clicking. Yeah. I I think that I think I like what you said about collaboration too, because that's the that's the key thing that I keep bumping into. It's this I, I keep it's interesting because it's always sort of seen as a as a tech thing and it is a tech thing, but I just keep bumping into organizations like two in the last week that I've talked to where Microsoft 365 is a centrally managed thing owned by the collaboration team. Two two very large organizations oh, wow. in a row um, that I that I was talking to about other stuff. Um, Microsoft 365 owned by the collaboration team, and I mean for me, it, it I've just put I just put it together while you were talking there. I mean, I think we're on this arc at the moment where you know, we, we had too much control or not enough enablement or something like that. And so, you know, we wanted to emphasize collaboration. And so now we have a collaboration team and collaborative things run by collaboration people. And now I'm seeing both of these organizations kind of dip into this point where the thing that they need to emphasize is some kind of control of the information on those platforms. Because before, you know, the risk was nobody could talk to anybody. So they were losing this huge source of productivity. Now the risk is that we've lost control of this stuff and we don't know what's on there, who's using it, anything like that. And so I feel like there's a bit of an arc coming where we're going to see that stuff transition into more risk focus, into a more risk focused domain, or at least some kind of integration of you know, more risk-focused perspectives because, again, both of these organisations are trying to do the, exactly that at the moment. Yeah, I think it's um, it's it's really interesting, this sort of um, an expectation that, you know, people want absolute freedom in their workplace and often they don't. Often they want, you know, a really good couple of options perhaps or, you know. Um, well, they want to do their work. They don't want to, yeah. to think about. They want it to be. They want it to be easy. Yeah, like, yeah. that's the that's the, the connotation, isn't it? The freedom it. is easy, but you know, the freedom is not easy when you have to find records being created by you know the, the other three hundred people in your business unit that you know are working on the same type of thing, and you need something that one of them did six months ago, and yeah. because we're all so free here, now you can't find it. And if, I mean, if, you know, if, if beginning your work essentially starts with, okay, I think I need a wheel, I'm going to have to invent one, then, you know, that that's not ideal. So Well said. I like that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And point number three, then. Thank you very much. <laughs> content types. You're welcome. Content types was my number yes. three. Right. Um, so content types are, you know, a very well established thing. They've been around for yonks technical term um and a content type is essentially like a templated version of a thing so we'll start with a document because that's the simple one um and you can say okay this type of document um i'm going to say that its content type is for instance a policy and because it's that content type it's going to get this metadata and why I think this is really important and why I wanted to mention it in the context of the other things is because I can publish that content type. So I can say, right, policies are going to be a thing that you can create in every site or in all of the sites that meet these criteria. And a content type then is your way of getting a kind of centralized um, mechanism for getting particular standard metadata and fields out there in the world. Um, when you don't have a hierarchy yeah so when sites are not sitting in a hierarchy and you can't say cool everything that's in this branch of the taxonomy gets these 
um, metadata applied to it or, or made available in it. And you can do a bunch of things with content types. Um, so one of the things is you can hang a template off it. So if I choose my policy yeah. content type, then I actually get a, for instance, Word document you know, template. Um, so the actual structure inside the document itself. Uh, well, I mentioned obviously that one of the primary reasons is you would use it because you want particular metadata fields. So, you know, it's a policy, perhaps it has an approver, perhaps it has a renewal date or, you know, something like that. It has a status, like this is approved. Um, and then another thing that you can do is you can actually turn a content type into what's called a managed property. If someone wants to go look that one up and that makes it available as a thing that you can search on. So you can say, right, I'm trying to find that thing and I expect it to be a policy. And so provided people are actually using content types, you can do a search and go show me where the policies, you know, show me the policies that say, I don't know, you know, um, leave entitlement or something. You know, it becomes another me mechanism for findability. And then that can, you can customize the search so that it can show up as a filter or, you know, um, whatever you like. And then in the back end as well, once you've said, okay, content type is a managed property, you can start using that in the back end rules that you get in Microsoft Purview. So you can use it in a um, information protection policy. You can say when the content type is this, you know, then I want this information to be protected a certain way, or even I want this retention label applied to it, which will mean that it's going to be kept for a certain time. So yeah, so so they're, they're really flexible. Um, and the lucky last thing I really wanted to say about them is I'd really encourage people to think about establishing a content type um, that you push out to every site when you're creating sites where you expect people to work on interesting things um, so that then if you go, oh, oh, we actually missed a field, like we didn't do our beautiful architecture in advance and we realized we need a new one, you can just update the content type once and uh, you know, add that field to it, and that field then becomes available everywhere where that content type's already been established. So if you make sure as part of your design, you make sure you've got you know my organization's base document content type, um, then you've given yourself an easy mechanism to um, push out additional fields or make changes to those fields over time. And yeah. I always, I always think that there's. I've quite a nice diagram for this actually. There are those types which are going to. There's that metadata that is going to be common to every single document that you produce, obviously, author title, that kind of stuff. And then those content types, which are like you say, policy or maybe a project document or um, meeting minutes or something, which are used right across again, right across the organization, but they need very specific metadata. They need the name of the project or they need the name of the meeting or whatever it is. Um, and then there will be some areas that need their own, that may need their own content types, their own, certainly their own metadata. So it's kind of three flavors really in, in my mind at any rate. Yeah. And another thing about them, which I don't see commonly talked about when people are like, oh, I think we need a content type, is that you can essentially nest them. So you can say, right, this is our base content type for documents across the organization. Yeah. And that needs these three fields, you know, some kind of, I don't know, security related thing and maybe a document status and a, a subject or a topic. And then you could say, oh, but also a policy needs those three things. And so it's kind of the child of the, the base uh, document content type and you know, add extra fields to it. And this is why you absolutely need a metadata framework across the organization so that you are all using the same metadata fields to mean the same thing. You can use them across all your content type, oh, and the ones that are appropriate to use across all, but you know what I mean? Everything is consistent across what's being created. Excellent. That was great. Yeah. And it actually helped me solve a problem that I've been chewing on, so. Oh, that's good. good. All righty. So a bit of a different episode there, but uh, interested in other people's thoughts. Um, we'll make sure that there's um, a couple of links in the show note to Microsoft's own uh, documentation on this topic 
And uh, we will catch you for episode number two. Number two. Number two. <laughs> yeah, we're going to revisit. Life, the universe, and everything. Life, universe, and everything. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's right. Brilliant. Nice one. All right. Talk to you then. See you okay. all. Bye.